chemical reactions that create a stereogenic center typically create a pair of enantiomers. So while we might write the reaction like this, we know when we're being careful that this is a stereogenic center. So we really should write the two enantiomers. And generally, when we're creating a stereogenic center from a molecule that didn't have one, and we're using typical reagents, this uh, molecule is created as a racemic mixture, which means that we have 50-50. If we have 100 molecules in a flask, we have 50 of them that are one and 50 of them that are the other. And for many things, this is okay. It doesn't matter. But sometimes in chemistry, we'd like to have just one of the two enantiomers. And for medicinal use, for drugs, we almost always want just one of those stereogenic centers. One enantiomer is active, the other one is inactive. Yeah, the inactive one might even have some bad side effects. So we really would rather have just one. These guys are not easy to separate. And because they have the same melting points, same boiling points, same solubilities, etc. These guys are indistinguishable in physical properties, except that we remember that they rotate the plane of plane polarized light in opposite directions, but that's not going to help us separate. On the other hand, somebody thinking about it would say, boy, I wish these were diastereomers. They're different molecules, so they have different melting points, different body points, different solubilities. Heck, they even have different chemical properties. And the different solubilities is often a property that people take advantage of. But we have to change this mixture of R and S into a mixture of diastereomers to make this happen. And if we change the enantiomers into a mixture of diastereomers, we have to choose chemistry that lets us change it back again. That's all possible. That works. Here's the principle. We treat this mixture with a reagent, chiral reagent. Because we don't know the chemistry yet, let's just skip the details of the chemistry, but let's just say it's something that has a structure just the R chirality. So when we have these enantiomers react with this reagent, this is the RR, this is the SR. Now these now have the different properties that we were talking about over here. So often it's on the basis of recrystallization, but it could be on the basis of something else if it works better. We can separate them. And we have the RR, Diastereomer in one flask, and we have the SR in another. They're different compounds, we separated them on the basis of some property, and now all that re remains to be done is remove this chiral portion that turned these things into diastereomers, and we'll just put minus this thing. There you have it. This is in one flask, this one's in a different flask. Now we can use these as more active drugs. We can use them for certain chemical studies as the optically active enantiomeric pure substances. This process is called resolution. It simply means we're separating them. Now this is a chemical method that's been used for a very long time. That was a long time ago that somebody realized that if they had diastereomers instead of enantiomers, the problem could be solved easily, and it is, but this is not the only way to go. Uh, some molecules it might be difficult to turn into diastereomeric derivatives that could then be recovered as an ant. It also requires chemistry, at least two chemistry steps plus a separation step to do all this. So it would be great if you could just separate those enantiomers directly without doing this, and there's a clever approach to doing this. Take a look. This is a process called chromatography, and I've got images up here of something called a chromatographic column. And those images I got from Wikipedia, just so that everybody knows, give pro proper credit. And the clever idea is the following. Normally we would put a mixture of things to separate on the top of this column. Using a solvent to get the compounds to go through it, we would have them separate on the basis of how well they stick to the stuff in that column, which is a porous material like sand. And one sticks better than the other, and so the one that doesn't stick so, so well comes out first as you drip solvent through this. Somebody said, hey, wait a minute, this could be chiral. 
So this is a chiral surface in the column. And then you take a mixture of your R and S and antimers and just put them in the column right on top. So initially those R and S and antimers are right there near the top of the column. And because the surface of the material in the column is chiral, these R and S and antimers are attracted to it more or less strongly. So as the material proceeds through the column, we've got stuff going on down through the column here. We go from a column that has the stuff that we just put on it to a column where we've used solvent to get the enantiomers to move through there. And here's the R. And we're saying in this case, the S moves faster because it attracted less. And here we go. The R's move down, but the S's move down further. And at some point, the R has moved down and the S has moved out. And then finally, as the R moved down, it ends up being collected secondly in a different flask. And so this is a resolution based on the differential properties of these two enantiomers toward a chiral surface. So when an extra chiral surface, those interactions will be different. One of those enantiomers will stick more than the other. It will move through the columns slower than the other. And this is a, another type of process for resolution. You don't have to change the structure. It can be done efficiently and relatively quickly. Probably won't see just what I show here, all S in one flask and all R in another, but this process could be repeated if necessary to achieve resolution. So chromatographic separation of enantiomers is a second method resolution.